If you're just starting this podcast, go back and listen from episode one. It'll make a lot more sense. When police first arrested Daniel Green and Larry Demery for the murder of James Jordan, Larry's family lived off a long, bumpy dirt road. I remember it was a white four-door Chevrolet wagon that I was driving, and um, so my gear was in the back, all the way in the back. Lori Fushi was a photographer for WRAL-TV back in 1993. She was working with reporter Deborah Morgan to cover the Jordan case. So our task that day, I went with our photographer, Lori Fushi, and uh, went up to the home of Larry Demery's family. And like we would any other case, you always want to give everybody the opportunity to defend the person who is accused of a crime. On the dirt road to the Demery's house, they met another news crew headed the opposite way. They stopped, and the crew told them, look, don't go down to the house. These people are dangerous. And of course, we're like, OK, sure, no problem. They didn't listen. They kept driving. And then we saw the house. We get out. As soon as they got out of the car, Larry Demery's father, Larry Demery Sr., stepped out onto the porch. He started yelling for them to leave. And he had a shotgun. I said, try to get the camera out of the car. And I was trying to basically negotiate with this man. And I said, please, if you don't mind, we would like to ask your opinion. You know, tell us about Larry. Tell us about what kind of a child he is. And he just started screaming. And then um, pretty quickly after that started firing. From WREL Studios, this is Follow the Truth the story of the James Jordan murder and the man who says he didn't do it. I'm Amanda Lamb. Larry Demery's father fired into the air over Deborah and Lori's heads, effectively scaring them off. So a day that was supposed to be about reaching out to Larry's family, getting his side of the case, turned into a story about a family who didn't want to talk and made that very clear. I said to leave, I leave now. Get. Larry Demery's father fired his gun when we approached his home and didn't want to comment about the arrest of his son. His son was being vilified in the news um, by reports all over the country, probably all over the world, and he was um, obviously under a lot of stress. I was not happy with the way he expressed that, but there are always two sides to a story, maybe more than two sides, but there's always another side, and so I just wanted to make sure that he was heard, but he didn't want to share. And Larry's story Well, it's a side we've never really heard. Over the years, a lot has been said about Daniel Green. Articles, documentaries, this podcast. But what about Larry? He's the entire other half of the case, the other person charged with the murder of James Jordan. Yet so often, he's just presented as the other guy. When he's talked about, it's usually in the context of Daniel's life or perspective. We know almost nothing about Larry, who he is, how he thinks about the murder, and everything that's happened since. Larry has said so little over the years about the case. Other than his interrogation and the trial, we have almost no tape of him. While going through the archives, we found news clips from the trial of reporters shouting questions at Larry each day as he went into the courthouse to testify. Mr. Demery, you worried about being cross-examined? Hey, Larry, some of the jurors say they think you were the trigger man. you have any reaction to that? Larry never responds. He hardly even looks at the reporters asking the questions. He just keeps going, head down. This is how Larry and his family have approached this case. They've talked to almost nobody, and they wouldn't talk to us. Larry's father has since passed away, but his mother and other family members didn't agree to an interview. We wrote to Larry himself in prison, but never heard back. So we've tried to put together a picture of Larry from the few scattered pieces we do have. 
We've talked about how Larry and Daniel met in elementary school. He was really my first, like he was my first real friend that I made. Uh, we, we met on the, you know, in, in the school um, playground. They grew up together, more like brothers than friends. Then, when Daniel was 16, he went to prison on an assault charge that was later overturned due to ineffective counsel. By 18, when Daniel got out, Larry had grown up. He had a job and a pregnant fiance. And Daniel says Larry told him he was now involved in the drug trade. What well, kinds of things did he do? I mean, he would carry drugs somewhere, like hidden? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, it was just, you would go and you would go to a spot, pick up the drugs, and, and take them to wherever somebody has it going to. Uh, whether it's going to, uh, whether the drugs are stashed like within the, the, the actual interior of the body of the car itself. Daniel says Larry was basically a drug mule. He would drive cars stashed with cocaine up and down the East Coast. But he says the job, the fiance, and the drug connections weren't all Larry had accumulated while Daniel was away. He'd also earned a long rap sheet for charges ranging from forgery to assault. He had an armed robbery charge. He had a felony assault charge that were in the same case that occurred in Pembroke, North Carolina. Prosecutor Johnson Britt. A woman who worked as a clerk at the store took the trash out. He knew the routine. He was standing behind the um, dumpster. And when she came out to put the trash in, he dropped a cinder block on her head. Um, hurt her severely. Um, he was arrested and charged with that, um, got out on bond. Um, he had some break-ins. He had a drug charge, possession of cocaine. And so, but he was out, out on bond on all these things. Before the James Jordan murder, Larry had at least 13 pending charges in other cases. At trial, Larry testified that by July of 93, he'd quit his job, making most of his money by committing robberies. Were you still working at Crestline at that time? Oh, no, by then I had already quit. Pretty much made a career out of committing crimes. Made a career out of committing crimes. Larry had a reputation around Lumberton. The cops knew him. They even talked about it in his interrogation. I mean, I'm, it's not like I ain't been through this before. That's what we know. You've been through it before and you know how the game's played. We know you know how the game's played. But now, you know, all I have to do now is get a photograph of you. Now, where am I going to get a photograph at? Do you know? They probably got one down here. So I'll bet you they do. In that interrogation, he starts by spinning a few lies he and Daniel had come up with. You're, you're a hard nut, aren't you? You're a hard nut, aren't you? Eventually, after several conversations with the authorities, Larry tells on Daniel saying he saw Daniel pull the trigger. I was surprised to see that um, you know, Larry was allegedly involved in this. Hugh Rogers represented Larry Demery in the James Jordan case. Saw the news broadcast and it showed Daniel and Larry's picture up on the screen. I said, Lord, what's Larry into now? It wasn't Rogers' first time representing Larry. He'd worked with him on a previous charge that got dismissed. So when the murder happened, the judge appointed him to the case. And Rogers, well, he has a very different view of Larry Demery than you might expect given his rap sheet. Always a nice, polite, gentle individual, uh, not, you know, some horrendous individual that I do have occasion to uh, represent every now and then that are what people might portray as a true heinous criminal. Larry was quite the opposite of that. And it turns out he was involved in some of these acts of violence involving other folks as well, he and Daniel both. But uh, that was a bit surprising, but uh, here's what it is. Polite and gentle aren't words you usually associate with someone charged with hitting a woman over the head with a cinder block. But it was this dichotomy that surprised a lot of people. Larry had gotten into more trouble than Daniel at this point. But Larry was also incredibly quiet, reserved. Like me and Larry are opposites. You know, like I, I'm, you know, I talk, uh, talk to people, I talk to anybody. Um, 
he's real quiet. Uh, and some people may think that's like weird, but he's just, he's just like his dad. And the difference in how Larry and Daniel carried themselves, it was seized on by the media. Remember that walk down when they were first arrested, when the sheriff essentially walked them around the courthouse, parading them for the cameras? Their personalities played into the narrative that was being spun, that Daniel was the aggressor, out front, head held high. Demery's an introvert. The people who saw them together always described him as, he's the quiet one. Daniel Green's the talker. And so, but that was the way he was always described. He kind of stood in the background, followed, followed Daniel. Larry had these unresolved cases, armed robbery, felony assault. Now he's looking at a first degree murder charge and he had admitted he was involved in Jordan's murder. His lawyer, Hugh Rogers, says Larry was in a tight spot. Our initial strategy, of course, was to try to get Larry's statement suppressed, that it was coerced by the uh, Cumberland County Sheriff's Department, the SBI, maybe some Robs County involvement as well. Some of the tactics the uh, officers used, um, we felt like went beyond constitutional bounds. Larry Demery's attorneys spent another day trying to convince the court that investigators illegally pressured him into making his now well-publicized and potentially damaging statement. For example, a very graphic threat of the death penalty by lethal injection. Had anybody in the prior occasions ever made any reference to sticking a needle up his ass from which he would not wake up and the context of capital punishment. Larry Demery left the courthouse after the judge said he'd need a few weeks to decide if his statements can be used in a trial. Ultimately, the judge denied their motion. So prosecutors would be allowed to use Larry's interrogation in court. Our strategy obviously had changed. And it's here, Prosecutor Johnson Britt says he saw an opportunity. What I had was a statement from Daniel Green with a whole bunch of lies in it, and I had a statement from Larry Demery that was as close to a confession to felony murder than any case I've ever had. And his lawyers knew that. And so it was time to um, cut their losses and move forward and try to do what they could do to save their client's life. And so I approached them about the possibility of a plea. Britt's offer went like this. Larry would plead guilty to all the charges against him, including the James Jordan murder. In return, the state would put all Larry's previous assault and robbery charges together into one judgment which carried a maximum sentence of 40 years in prison. As for the Jordan murder, Larry would agree to cooperate with the state's case against Daniel Green and testify at trial. It was the best shot Larry had at avoiding the death penalty, but it still wasn't a guarantee. In the Jordan case, there was no agreement as to a sentence. Under the law, in North Carolina at the time, I didn't have the discretion to take the, de the death penalty off the table. If I had a first degree murder con um, case and the person was convicted, then it was my duty as a prosecutor to seek the death penalty. The best Britt could do was promise he would tell the jury at sentencing that Larry had confessed to what he'd done and had testified against his co-defendant, Daniel. From there, it was up to the jury to decide whether Larry would live or die. More after the break. In April of 1995, Larry Demery walks into a courtroom wearing round wire-framed glasses, a white collared shirt, and a red tie. A barely visible mustache gives him the look of a boy becoming a man, right in front of the cameras. You know, the purpose of this hearing 
is that the de defendant, Larry Martin Demery, is changing his plea from one of not guilty uh, to guilty pursuant to a negotiated plea. Uh, Larry sits stoically at the defendant's table. Also, Hugh Rogers is by his side. There are a few people scattered throughout the gallery. This is months before Daniel's trial that will become a media frenzy, but many of the players are the same. Prosecutor Johnson Britt is at his own table, shuffling through his papers. Judge Gregory Weeks sits at the bench, shirt and tie peeking out from beneath his flowing black robe. Uh, if you'll stand up, please, sir, place your left hand on the Bible, raise your right and face the clerk. Judge Weeks reads off a list of Larry's charges, asking him to confirm his guilt after each one. As to those charges, the possible maximum punishment would be 60 years. Yes. You also understand that you're pleading guilty to three counts of robbery with a dangerous weapon, each of which is a class D felony, each of which is punishable by a maximum term of imprisonment of 40 years. Charge by charge, Larry affirms, yes, he's guilty, and yes, he'll testify against Daniel. And do you enter this plea of your own free will, fully understanding what you're doing here today? Yes. Mr. Demmer, do you have any questions about anything that I've said to you or anything uh, in uh, the context of this plea hearing? Did you believe Larry's story, his version of the story, the one he testified to? You know, I, I actually did and do um it was not ludicrous um as perhaps maybe some of daniel's earlier stories seem to be and you, you gonna... never you never felt like he was being forced or pushed or coerced his story no 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 no, no absolutely not here's rogers from 1996 talking about Larry's testimony in Daniel's trial. And he knows he's going to undergo a rigorous cross-examination, but we feel like he's ready for that. Uh, he's going to adhere to telling the truth, and if he does that, he's got nothing to be concerned about. One of the things that I believe that gets lost in the history of this case is how long Larry Demery was on the witness stand. People forget that he was on the stand for the better part of a week, and they, they continued to try to rip into him. For four days, Larry took the stand at Daniel's trial. He told his story, testifying against his former best friend. Notice the watch that he had on where the ring he was wearing. What made you notice the watch he was wearing? It was standing out real flashy. What, if anything, caught your attention about the ring that he was wearing? Well, nothing really at the time other than the size of it. What about the size caught your attention? Well, it had a, a big stone in it. Uh. Did he ever show any remorse? Yeah, I think so. Now, I can't say publicly or whatnot, but uh, I would say on the stand, there was times that you could tell that uh, he wasn't comfortable talking about his role in the situation. What about, though, uh, talking to you? Just the two of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You sense remorse? And that, and that goes back to what you asked me at the beginning as far as uh, my impressions of him. Did you get to know his family at all? Oh, yes, I did, yes. You know, how were they dealing with this? It sounds like, you know, this was a very close-knit family. This had to be very sad for them. It was. Um, certainly his mom was a very sweet lady, and... Uh, Got to know his dad as well, and uh, knew they had to support him, and uh, they gladly did that. And I think their support was uh, beneficial to him getting through all this. GQ magazine writer Scott Robb is, to this day, one of the very small number of journalists that Larry's family has ever spoken with. For some reason, the family that opened fire when other journalists showed up at their house opened the door to Scott. It's basically a trailer, and there's there's pine scented water on the radiator, you know, to scent, scent the room. And these are hard scrabble people whose son is involved in, you know, this high profile murder. He says Larry Demery Sr. stood in the background smoking a cigarette. His wife, Virginia, took the lead. 
I don't think there was anything but a reflexive belief that Larry, I mean, the idea that, that, that either kid could pull the trigger is really hard for me to accept. But this, these are Larry's parents. She tells Scott her son, quote, had done some things he shouldn't have, but there's no way he'd do something like that. No one on earth will ever convince me those two boys killed that man. Not in a million years, no matter how this comes out. Larry Demery has spent three years waiting for decision day, and today could be the day he finds out if he lives or dies. Demery's defense team says the only justice is life in prison. They also say he suffered from the effects of an abusive father and from the effects of a manipulative friend. We don't anticipate that uh, Larry will get the death penalty. He certainly... Uh, based on the evidence that we argued up there today, played a very, very minor role in this entire situation. That evidence is uncontradicted, unless Daniel Green takes the stand, and I would enjoy cross-examining him if that's the case. Uh. Demery's fiance and sister anxiously await the outcome of the case that has ruled their lives since 1993. Prosecutor Johnson Britt argued at Larry's sentencing that he was just as culpable as Daniel in Jordan's death. But he did put in a word about Larry's cooperation with the state. The final defense witness at the hearing was a psychiatrist who, according to news reports at the time, testified that Larry was easily led and under the influence of Daniel when Jordan was killed. The jury decided not to send Larry to death row. He said this to a term of natural life in the North Carolina Department of Corrections. Larry was sentenced to life in prison. He does have the opportunity to apply for parole. He's been eligible for release since 2013, and his case is reviewed every three years. He was the star state witness in the case against Daniel Green. It's getting closer to his time for parole, closer to times when he may be able to get jobs outside of a prison camp as opposed to uh, working within the camp. In both 2013 and 2016, the state denied Larry's parole. When we started reporting on this story, all of this stuff from the trial and Larry's plea, it was pretty much the sum total of what we knew about him. Like I said, he hasn't talked a lot publicly. But then, the deeper we went, we started hearing about these stories, times where people said Larry did talk to them, and what he had to say was surprising. For example, Daniel's mother, Elizabeth Green, says she heard from Larry. She got a card from him in prison about a decade ago. So you get this, you've never talked to Larry since then. And you get a card, and what does it say? How sorry he was, but he didn't have any choice. The blood was thicker than water. What do you think he meant by blood is thicker than water? Uh, there were rumblings that, you know, if things did not go the way that, that they wanted them to go, that his family was threatened. She says she lost the card in one of her moves. What do you think he was trying to tell you? I don't know. But he said, but I didn't have any, cho I didn't have any choice in the matter. Then in 2015, a woman named Connie Brayboy came forward. Brayboy was the editor in chief of the Carolina Indian Voice in the early 90s. The paper was based in Pembroke, North Carolina. And she says, much to our surprise, Larry did agree to one interview with her shortly after his arrest. But no one learned about this until Bray Boy spoke up. In that interview, she says Larry told her something that could have changed the entire case if it had gone public. But she never reported what he said. She says Larry told her that he killed James Jordan not Daniel Green. If this is true, not only does it back up what Daniel has been saying for years, it would mean Larry's testimony was a lie. 
and that throws so much from the trial into question. We reached out to Brayboy, but she didn't speak to us for the podcast. When she came forward in 2015, she did an interview with Daniel's attorneys at the time. We have a sworn affidavit from that interview. Here's Daniel's current attorney, Chris Muma. In her affidavit, she says that Demery told her that uh, he killed Jordan. Brayboy says, quote, During my conversation with Larry Demery, Mr. Demery stated to me that he was the person who had shot and killed Mr. James Jordan. Larry Demery told me that he killed Mr. Jordan because he had witnessed a drug transaction. Brayboy goes on to say that the murder took place outside the car, not inside the Lexus, as Larry testified to at trial. So why did this never come out back in 1993? No one really knows for sure. A fellow Lumbee, Brayboy was apparently friends with Virginia Demery and worried that revealing what Larry had told her would impact the Demery family as well as the Lumbee community. Um, I think there's a very, very strong, um, rightfully so, uh, Indian community and um, I think she was uh, felt obligated to honor that, and, and I, you know, I think there's probably been a lot of people threatened in this case, um, and that that is theory, uh, but I think uh, she was probably threatened not to come forward. But Ray Boy's story isn't enough on its own to set Daniel free. It's secondhand. It's hearsay. A judge would need to hear it from Larry's mouth directly in order for it to make a legal difference. Since Chris Muma started working on Daniel's case in 2016, she's been trying to make that happen. She believes Larry's testimony convicted Daniel, and now his word could set Daniel free. She tried every angle to get Larry to agree to a meeting, sent him several letters trying to convince him it's the right thing to do, that it's time to come clean, to unburden himself, she even appealed to his spirituality, asking about his belief in God. He said, you know, don't, don't play those games with me. Don't try and use guilt trips on me because guilt trips won't work with me. Come here and be honest and I'll meet with you. Muma went. On New Year's Eve 2018, she drove to the prison where Larry was held in Scotland County, North Carolina. She hoped Larry would give her something anything to help Daniel's case. Um, decided it would be a good st step to take for the, for the end of the year, 2018, that we had worked so hard on Daniel's case and maybe we'd have something to start the new year with. Turns out she got a lot more than she expected. He said he did not see Daniel Green shoot James Jordan. That's on the next episode of Follow the Truth. Follow the Truth is written by me, Amanda Lamb, and Cliff Bumgardner. Cliff also produces the show. Shelley Leslie is our executive producer. The show is edited and mixed by Wilson Sayre. Our production manager is Anita Normanly. Original music is by George Hodge and Lee Rosevere. Audio repair help by Isaac Rodriguez. Additional reporting by Clay Johnson, Jay Jennings, and the many other WRAL TV journalists whose coverage you hear throughout the story. The show is represented by Melinda Morris Sinoni and Legacy Talent Entertainment with branding and digital marketing by Capital B Creative. Special thanks to Dave Beesing. Thanks for listening. Leave a comment and share this video with your friends. With daily uploads, there will always be a conversation.